Welcome back. Who is in charge of single family rental homes in your neighborhood? The answer is usually local investors, but that is changing. Wall Street's now moving into the rental market for single family homes in cities like Atlanta, Phoenix, and Las Vegas, and that's because some firms have created a new investment product that's based on those kind of home rentals. The shift is part of an effort by Blackstone Group, a multi-billion dollar investment firm which now owns more of these homes than any other company. Blackstone's using what it calls a rental home platform, Invitation Homes, to purchase 43,000 homes, rent them out, and cut up and distribute the profits as part of their new financial product. In finance, they call that securitization, and it enables investors to receive funds from different rental units. Now, here's how Blackstone put it in a 2012 press release. The program removes distressed inventory from the market, which has been suppressing national home prices, creating jobs and providing high-quality, affordable housing for families. Blackstone says that by enabling more investors to buy a piece of this market, new capital actually goes to communities that need it most, a sort of a win-win and other companies are following suit. But here's the thing. Given the track record of Wall Street in our housing market, are these efforts right? Well, they're drawing scrutiny. Fed Chair Janet Yellen said during her November confirmation hearing, this market should be watched very carefully. She also said the interest in low-cost homes is a logical response of the market. Meanwhile, 75 housing and consumer groups sent a new letter warning we may be headed towards the creation of another housing bubble. And a new article in Mother Jones Magazine's questions, what happens if this security blows up? And then there's this exhaustive report from the Center for American Progress, the progressive policy shop, suggesting that Blackstone's approach could hurt renters and potentially destabilize communities if these financial products, these bonds, sour. Now, we asked Invitation Homes about all this. They responded with a statement to MSNBC, saying in part, quote, we're committed to building a national long-term network that caters to the portion of the market that will always need or prefer to rent. Our investments have played a small but positive role in stabilizing housing markets. Economists have said that institutional investors' collective purchases of 200,000 homes out of the more than 5 million sold last year has had a negligible impact on rental rates, end quote. And for this reporting, we also spoke with Blackstone right here in New York and invited their staff to appear on this segment. They declined, but they emphasized that Blackstone securities, based on these rental homes, are a tiny part of the housing market currently. They are only present in 14 markets, they say. More than 70% of their renters renew, and their purchases of foreclosed homes lead to new tenants in better neighborhoods. Blackstone also disputed, and this is interesting, they disputed reports that their security depends on rental income. They told us, quote, there's no such thing as a rental bond. Center for American Progress and others have mischaracterized this securitization as that of a rental income from the homes. That's incorrect. This is a securitization of assets themselves. In this case, about 3,500 homes. The same practice is commonly used to finance assets of all types. All right. But one member of Congress is pushing back. Congressman Mark Takano says, quote, it just reminds me of the too-big-to-fail schemes of the subprime mortgage crisis. He's now calling for investigative hearings and joins us today. If we've learned anything from the last housing crisis, it's to ask questions early and loudly before some of these confusing financial products spread and create bubbles we may not be able to afford to pop. Now, with us to discuss all of this is Josh Barrow, a national correspondent for The New York Times with a history working in some of these related markets, and he's an MSNBC contributor. David K. Johnson, contributing editor at Newsweek, professor of law at Syracuse University. Laura Godestiner, a journalist who's been covering this story for Mother Jones Magazine. Doreen Warren's also back with us. And she is the author, I should also mention, of the book, A Dream Foreclosed. I want to go directly to you, Congressman. Uh, you represent California's 41st District. You've said this is an issue for your constituents. You've heard our reporting today, Congressman, on the issue and the responses uh, from Blackstone. Uh, tell us what's important here in your mind. Well, what's important is that we get ahead of the curve this time. Uh, you know, with the subprime mortgage crisis and the mortgage-backed securities, uh, we just weren't um, fully uh, understanding of uh, what risks they pose for the economy. And I'm not calling for a ban for this new instrument. And let's, I want to emphasize it is a new uh, security that Blackstone has developed. Um, and I represent uh, a part of the country that was very hard hit 
by the subprime mortgage crisis. Uh, we've seen uh, one out of every 10 homes foreclosed upon in my uh, county of Riverside, uh, Riverside County uh, in California. And uh, we've suffered greatly. I just think that it behooves us uh, to understand these uh, securities and to understand what risks they might pose uh, to uh, the economy, and more, you know, more importantly, what it means to the uh, sure. areas of the country like mine. Yeah, and, and I, that makes a lot of sense, which is why we want to talk to you. But I want to get your response directly. What, what Blackstone and Invitation Homes are saying here is basically that people like you, sir, uh, not specifically you, but people who've been critical in raising these questions have it backwards, that they're actually bringing new capital into these communities. Are they wrong? Well, they're not wrong. Uh, uh, they're, uh, we've seen a run-up in prices 20% uh, in one year. So not everything is bad. I mean, I, I can't say that they're entirely bad, and I'm not calling for an outright ban. I'm calling simply for hearings. I'm calling for regulatory agencies to do more dil due diligence. Look, uh, Standard & Poor's and Fitch are rating agencies that gave blessings to these mortgage-backed mm -hmm. securities. Uh, this time around, they're withholding their full blessings on these securities. And and, uh, and as well, you, uh, you've also mentioned the Fed had its concerns as yeah. well. So uh, I think, at the very least, we need to do more dil due diligence. And we, I, it's more than just the congressional staff to look into these uh, securities. Yeah. Uh, we need other agencies and the financial services community to look at them as well. Yeah, I mean, Congress, when you raise such an important point there, uh, folks may remember the ratings agencies basically said that some of the most toxic, dangerous investments last time around were almost perfect, the highest rating they could get, and they were far from perfect. So, I mean, I think you raise a cautionary point there. I want to keep you here, but go broaden out to our panel. Laura, you've written about this a lot. What do you make of it? I think it's important to say you know, we're, we're seeing an incredible amount of reporting on the house re, housing recovery. Who is this a housing recovery for? Who's benefiting mm. from this recovery? Who's benefiting? Who's making money off of the rising home values? I think it's important to say, you know, we're seeing Wall Street consolidating an incredible number of houses, 200,000 single family rental homes and counting across the country. That doesn't sound like a regular housing recovery to me. That doesn't sound like a housing recovery that's going to benefit what does it sound ordinary like? Americans. It sounds like a Wall Street housing recovery. It sounds like they're consolidating greater grip over our everyday lives and not just buying these houses or renting them back to the very same families that were just foreclosed on, but now creating a new security asset class that is going to become you know, economists are estimating a $1 trillion market in the next six years. Yeah. Josh? I mean, I think this is something that needs to be watched, but I actually think it's a pretty hopeful thing. The way that these homes are being owned and financed looks to me very similar to the way that apartment buildings across the country have been owned and financed for decades. And that's a system that actually works pretty well. One problem we had in the U.S. that led to the housing bubble was that if you want to live in a single-family home, in most cases you have to buy it. The rental market is not deep. It is difficult to, it's a difficult challenge to own and manage these properties as rentals. So to the extent that we can have a deep institutional market in single-family home rentals, that will allow people to not take all the money they have in the world and put it in a highly leveraged real estate investment in a home that might go bad. Instead, Blackstone will take on that investment and take on the investment risk. I, I think we should learn the lessons of recent history here. <laughs> history doesn't repeat itself, but it does rhyme sometimes. <laughs> if you, th th this raises red flags. And so one question I think we have to ask is in what communities are we seeing this? Because if they're in communities of color, that should be the first red flag. Mm. We saw this in the 1990s with the creation of and the expansion of subprime lending into minority communities that had been racially discriminated against, redlined for decades by state policy and discrimination by lenders, then all of a sudden, it's almost like reverse redlining. 900%. That was the increase in subprime loans in the 1990s. So we knew this was a problem in minority communities before we even crossed the threshold to the 21st century so, so that me, led to the, how, the, the burst of the, of the bubble. An important uh, point in a context in markets that we know have been found to have aggregate discrimination. Congressman, I want to bring you back in on that point, that concern, uh, and also the idea that's been raised by the Center for American Progress, among other experts, and rebutted by Blackstone, the argument that this could lead to people being forcibly removed from their rental properties. Um, do you think that's a possibility here? 
Well, um, that's a, there's a consumer protection issue. Uh, you know, Blackstone and other large investors have very little track record or experience uh, in managing, uh, managing properties uh, this extensively. 40,000 homes across the country. Um, these single-family homes were not built or designed to be rent or occupied. Mm. They were designed to be uh, occupied by uh, individual homeowners and people in these neighborhoods have expressed concerns to me in my own district about what what's going to happen to the neighborhoods, how the character of them is going to change, how well these properties are going to be maintained, mm -hmm. uh, and indeed the risk for the rating agencies is just how local governments might respond. Uh, they may impose rent control. They may impose all sorts of other. There's a lot of uncertainties uh, that they pose for uh, the the investors who buy these bonds. So you know the the risks of being a land uh, lord are being spread spread across to many investors uh, uh, without a lot of skin in the game by, uh, you know, these investment groups like Blackstone. David? Well, uh, the congressman is exactly right. Uh, I've been a landlord. There's a reason it's a mom and pop business in housing as opposed to Josh mentioning big apartment projects. Maintaining these properties is not easy. And one of the things we're highly likely to see is deterioration in the quality of the stock of real estate. And Blackstone has essentially no skin in this game. They are borrowing the money to acquire these buildings. That statement they put out that you read that I'm sure to a lot of people was gobbledygook simply means well, it's not the rental income that secures the property, it's a mortgage on the property mm -hmm. itself. If the mortgages aren't paid because there's no rental income, then the property will be foreclosed on again. But, but that's not right. Blackstone is the equity in these things. It's different from the situation that we had during the housing bust. Blackstone bus. says in yeah. its 10K, yeah. we own no real estate. The, the, right let, me pick that, let me pick up that point, because that is a dispute for a good reason. I want to go to that when we come back. Um, the housing crisis across the color line, why some neighborhoods are still feeling the impact, that's next. Plus. Welcome back. The effects of the subprime mortgage crisis were felt deeply not only because of the extent of the financial impact, which was big, but also because of the direct impact that it had on so many people's lives, the loss of their homes, home ownership has long, of course, been hailed as the staple of the American dream. And we've been reminded of how housing is also a civil rights issue so many times, especially in these past few years. Black homeowners, for example, were three times as likely to get the highest rated mortgages, which helped lead to the housing bubble, and they lost more home equity when it burst. The Justice Department under President Obama has been actively bringing forward cases of discriminatory lending practices, discrimination in rentals and sales that disproportionately impact African-American and Hispanic borrowers. Housing isn't just any market. It is in many ways the market. It's where people live and their ability to access housing has been critical to their ties to their community and their entire lives, obviously. We go back to our panel here. And Dorian, I want to start with you on this point. Mm -hmm. um, when we talk about corrections, Apple overstates something and the stock is corrected and the stock moves up and down and investors lose or gain money. We as a society have generally said we're more comfortable with that and that fluctuation, buyer beware, than a correction in a housing market, which means you lose your home because of a macroeconomic factor you had nothing to do with. And as you pointed out, the racial disparities are stark because home ownership is the primary source of wealth for most people and because blacks and Latinos were target it more than white families yes. for these subprime loans. It means when the bubble burst, they lost much more of their wealth than did whites. And by the way, that added to the already existing disparity. Yes. And so I think what we're seeing and what we should be worried about is something very similar to Blackstone. When Wells Fargo settles with the U.S. government for $175 million for its subprime lending practices and then markets that settlement back to black and Latino families in the very communities that are, have the highest rates of foreclosure as if it's a good corporate citizen, that should worry us because they're engaging right. in the exact same and the, processes and it's not a market right. correction. And the link here that we're talking about and the reason why we did play so much sound uh, and quotes from Blackstone is a link here that we don't know where it leads yet. Mm -hmm. That is debated, David. Yes. And yet the leverage and the complexity, if it's hard to follow this segment, right, for some folks, although they're interested, it's also hard to follow these documents and understand just what's in the security, and that could be bad for us, right? Well, here's the simple things we do know. The bottom 90% income is down 15% since 2009. That means housing prices overall can't be rising. People can't afford more housing. Mm -hmm. We know that Blackstone and others are trying to once again weaken the standards for underwriting 
Who benefits from that? People who make their money off fees connected to housing. This is not good for the housing market. So I think we ought to be very skeptical about what's going on. And yet, Josh, go ahead. Yeah. But, th but this is a reason to be glad to have a deeper rental market, because owning a home is fundamentally an investment. And owning a oh, home with a, with a mortgage, yes, it, but it's, no, it's an investment yeah. in real estate. And if you own, and if you have a mortgage on it with high leverage, then it's a speculative investment. And, and the Obama administration, at the same time that has been pushing back on banks for the bad practices in the, in the last housing bubble, has has been pushing them to weaken credit standards and to offer higher leverage mortgages because they too want to push people into home ownership and prop up housing prices. This I see as an alternative model in which people can live in homes without owning them and without taking on that investment risk. So if we don't want families to be in this position where they are the ones left holding the bag when housing prices fall, we have to figure out who else is going to own the homes and take on that risk. And so let me bring back Congressman Takano. I mean, what Josh Barrow is talking about there is an argument the industry makes uh, that you get people in the city single-family homes who otherwise wouldn't be in them. Well, look, we've seen a run-up uh, in just a single year of 20 percent in prices. Uh, we have a dual problem here. Rents are rising because of the lack of inventory and also housing prices. Middle-class families, aspiring homeowners, simply can't compete against the, that kind of price appreciation and the cash buyers, the power of them. Look. Uh, my neighborhoods, my mayors, uh, my cities uh, really would want to have people who have a stake in the community in these homes. We need homeowners. Uh, you know, they just simply make um, much, much better, uh, uh, you know, uh, a bet for the community. Yeah. Um, so I'm concerned about that, and I'm concerned about that we should be doing more to help the middle class get into these yeah. homes. Um, well, and con yeah, not, Congressman, yeah. I appreciate that, and I know you're working on this issue, and I think if you do get those hearings, Melissa Harris-Perry would probably love to get an update from you. Uh, appreciate your time today from Los Angeles.